Lasers are everywhere. In doctor's surgeries, your DVD player, even in the club. But before lasers came masers, like lasers, but using microwaves instead of light. Based on an effect predicted by Einstein, masers were invented in the 1950s, but scientists only ever managed to make them either at super cold temperatures or a high vacuum. They did find some uses, like amplifying faint signals from deep space, but they were soon eclipsed by the much more practical laser. Well now, scientists have found a new way to generate masers at room temperature, and they did it with diamonds. I went to the London Centre Hello, for thanks. Nanotechnology Welcome. to Welcome find to out now. more. I'm Jonathan Breeze, I'm a research fellow at Imperial College London and I've been working on room temperature masers for the past eight years and recently we managed to demonstrate a continuous room temperature maser that uses diamond. Before getting to that though, John took me through how masers and lasers work. The maser acronym and the laser acronym both stand for either microwave or light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And in order to get stimulated emission, what you need is a population of electrons where you have two energy levels, and there are more electrons in the higher energy level than the lower energy level. This putting electrons into a higher state is called a population inversion. If you can make one of those, then the maser fun can begin. An incoming photon causes one of the electrons to drop down to a lower energy level. When it does that, it emits a photon, and not just any photon, one that's identical to the photon that just zoomed by. These then trigger more electrons to drop, releasing more photons in a chain reaction that scientists call stimulated emission. It's a sort of exponential photocopier for photons. And if the photons are in the microwave part of the spectrum, boom, you get a maser. So it was possible to make the population inversion in, um, in rubies, which they used for masers, but the, the population didn't last very long, so it only lasted for a fraction of a billionth of a second. Um, and so they had to cool it down to cryogenic temperatures to make it last for a, a few millionths of a second. So it was still quite a short amount of time. John and his colleagues needed to find a material that could sustain a population inversion at room temperatures. They had some success with an organic polymer, but that could only generate a pulsed maser. To make a continuous version, they turned to diamonds. So you can see actually, this is the core of the mesa. Mm -hmm. And then inside, you can see the diamond in V-Center. Really small. In V-Center diamond. There are many color centers in diamond, and in V-Center is one of the most extensively researched color center in the diamond. NV centers, or nitrogen vacancies, are defects in the diamond structure, which also make it pink. Where carbon atoms are knocked out, electrons sit in the gaps. The electrons can exist at levels that are separated by the right amount of energy to emit microwaves. And the diamond's stable structure keeps a population inversion, even at room temperature. As well as the diamond, there's a sapphire resonator, which acts like a mirror to help intensify the microwaves the maser produces. And everything is kept in a copper housing called a cavity. So basically, this maser assembly comprising the cavity, the sapphire ring resonator and the maser medium, that's diamond, will go in between the poles of a magnet, mm -hmm. a powerful magnet. And then what we do actually, we shine a green laser. And when the laser hits the NV centers, the diamond glows a rich pink. That's actually just a byproduct of a much more important process, putting the electrons into their higher energy state. When this is combined with a precisely calibrated magnetic field, you get that crucial population inversion. Then add the sapphire resonator and the copper housing, and out pops a maser. When I, we first got involved with the diamond, I did quite a bit of theory. I'm generally theory-led, so I don't want to waste my time doing an experiment that I know won't work. And all the theory pointed towards it working. We had been trying for about a year to, to to kind of observe this amazing phenomenon. And we'd had no, no kind of positive results. And then we saw this quirky um, phenomenon, and I knew what that was, and I got very excited. So the next day, everyone was there. We were all excited, actually. So it was a really great day. <laughs> you guessed it, they'd made a maser. 
I had to go for a walk to calm myself down. So yeah, it was really, it wasn't a eureka moment, but it was definitely, you know, a we did it moment. Their Mazer is still pretty weak, but it's a proof of principle. And the fact that it uses NV center diamonds is exciting because these are already being studied for other applications. Quantum computing, uh, room temperature, and also uh, what's called quantum metrology. The fact that we, we use that, um, that kind of diamond for our maser should hopefully open up uh, a new branch in the kind of quantum diamond technology. This technique could not only make for cheaper and more convenient masers, it might mean masers end up being used in loads more places than today. But since this device is new, it's hard to know yet where that will be. Over the past half century or so, lasers have cropped up everywhere. Now the Maser's found a new lease of life, who knows where it could end up? <laughs>